Chapter three of your textbook is on bodies, and it begins with um, kind of the interesting example of the anglerfish. So the female anglerfish is much bigger than the male uh, and has the ability to attract prey. The male anglerfish is very small um, and has no lure, um, so can't attract food on its own. And even if it could, it has no stomach, so it wouldn't be able to digest it. So the only way that the male anglerfish survives is by attaching itself to a female anglerfish um, and basically uh, receiving uh, nutrients um, through that attachment, um, but eventually the male anglerfish just kind of dissolves into the female anglerfish. The only thing it leaves behind is a pair of testicles, um, and so a female anglerfish can have multiple pairs of testicles attached to her, um, which just kind of is indicative of the male partners um, the female anglerfish has had uh, in her past. Um, so yay, fun. We begin with weird animal facts. And that's because the authors are really just trying to make the point that we are not anglerfish. Um, human bodies do not have that level of high sexual dimorphism. And di sexual dimorphism is a term that we've discussed in previous videos. And so just a reminder, um, although the anglerfish is an extreme example, there are other uh, animals when we look to the animal kingdom, whether you're talking about lions or uh, ducks or peacocks or, um, you know, orangutans or, or elephant seals, right? There are these other animals that look dramatically different um, in terms of the male and the female uh, of the species. And that's just not true of the human body. You know, obviously we are, are different. We do have some differences. We have our, you know, primary sexual uh, characteristics, which are our, our genitalia. Um, and then we have our secondary sexual characteristics um, that normally come in at puberty. Um, and in general, you know, for women, that would be like things like breast and for men, um, you know, they're hairier. But I mean, these are, are minute differences when you're thinking about um, other animals in the animal kingdom. And that's why we say that humans have low sexual dimorphism. Um, even though we talk about ourselves as if, you know, we're opposite sexes. That was the point of the, the last chapter, right, when we discussed the gender binary. That, you know, there is this ideology that we're not just really different, but like we're really dramatic, opposite, polar opposite, different. Um, and, you know, the conclusion of that chapter is that's just not true. Um, you know, that was the whole point of chapter two was breaking down the fact that, you know, you know, women are not from Venus and men are not from Mars. We're both from Earth. And the fact of the matter is we aren't even from different countries. We are like from the same town, maybe just one road over. Um, we aren't that different. But, and this is the question that kind of guides chapter three on bodies, the question here for this chapter is, there are, you know, they're asking, are there real differences between men and women? And so, you know, before they, the authors get into answering that question, you know, they, they point out that, you know, this is difficult to answer. And they talk about, you know, why it's difficult to answer. Um, first reason being differences can vary over time and across cultures. Um, human beings, what, you know, being the socio-cultural animals that they are, you know, we adapt and we change and, you know, what it means to be a man uh, in 20 20 America is different than what it means to be a man in 2020 Japan or 2020 Nigeria or 2020 Brazil. Likewise, what it means to be a woman in 2020 America is different than a woman in 1970 America, which is different than a woman in 1920 America, which is different than women in 1820 America. So, you know, when we're talking about real differences, like, you know, we, we have to account for that variability. Second point as to why it's difficult, um, differences can respond to psychological manipulation manipulation and practice and training. If you think of something as being a real difference, then it should be stable and it should be consistent. So what does it say if some of these differences um, that we think of as being real and stable actually are so 
um, susceptible to this manipulation. And we'll talk more about that in, in, in this video. Uh, number three, differences are sensitive to how we design studies and define measurements, right? So, you know, if, if we measure strength by, uh, you know, number of push-ups on, on the toes or number of pull-ups, um, then that gap between men and women might be very different than if we measure, uh, you know, strength in a different way, um, like, you know, squatting a percentage of the body weight, um, just because of how men's and women's muscle mass uh, tend to be uh, differently uh, allotted. Um, so, you know, or uh, in terms of something like sociability, right? Um, you know, if we measure it in terms of smiling, um, you know, then women might look like they're much more sociable. But if we measure it in terms of something else, then once again, that difference might go away. And then finally, we would have to amass a lot of evidence and then we would have to consider all the possible influences. And so it, it would just really be a massive undertaking. Which isn't to say there haven't been uh, studies, uh, systematic reviews that have attempted to do just that. So the systematic review that your book focuses on is the Zale and fellow researchers. Um, they studied the differences between men and women by basically amassing a huge data set that was comprised of 20,000 different studies, 12 million people, uh, over 12,000 measures of 386 traits. So it was one of the largest studies of its time. And what, uh, and what they found was that for 39% of those 386 traits, there was basically no statistical difference, right? So there was no discernible difference between males and females. For 46% of the traits, there was only a small statistical difference. And so an example of some of those traits would be like talkativeness, leadership style, assertiveness of speech. Um, and once again, you, these small differences, and, and especially when, when considering the fact how things can be very susceptible to measurement, you know, they were like, okay, can't make a big deal out of these small statistical differences across these traits because this might just be a, 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 me, a matter of measurement. Then we get into the larger differences where we really can start like with a little bit more confidence basically saying, okay, maybe there really is a real difference here. Um, so when it comes to medium sized differences, this was 12% of traits and some of them, and, and these are the ones because, you know, they are large, they are a larger difference. They're going to come up again in the chapter um, as we kind of talk about, are they real or are they not? Um, but things like physical aggression, uh, visual, spatial, um, you know, uh, visual, spatial uh, kind of understanding um, and knowledge and, and skills, uh, physical. Um, and so like this, uh, one that often comes up a lot uh, is the throw like a girl. Um, and I always like to show uh, both of these clips in class. So I'm encouraging you to watch them on your own. One of them is the always commercial, uh, like a girl. Um, and one of the things they ask, um, you know, people, uh, women, men, boys and girls to do is do mimic doing different things like a girl. Um, and I, I don't want to ruin it for those of you who've never seen it. It, but, you know, I, I encourage you to just watch it and think about the implications. And then there was this very interesting segment on Mythbusters. I don't know if I have any Mythbusters fans, but it was about throwing like a girl. And uh, once again, just kind of, you know, watch that and, and consider uh, consider the conclusions that they come to. So those things were, were medium differences. When it comes to large differences, that was 2% of traits, and most of them were related to sexuality, particular things like how often, um, you know, do you think about sex? How often do you masturbate? Um, and um, in the same way um, that I'm going to later pick apart the social aspect aspects or the social underpinnings of throwing like a girl, you know, I would just want you to kind of consider how in a society, um, you know, that traditionally for like the last, you know, couple of centuries in most places in, in, in Western culture, you know, there is this stigma around female sexuality that doesn't exist around male sexuality.
where men are given permission um, to be studs and women are labeled sluts, um, you know, and how this might, especially since for they did note, you know, for this particular measure, it was just self reports, right, about how often people thought about sex, how often they masturbated, you know, just consider how that might would then lead to these large differences. Um, and we'll come back to uh, an interesting point that the authors make about uh, make about that difference here in a second. And the final one, um, which is 1% of traits, um, extra large differences. This is pretty straightforward and it probably really just has a lot to do with how we label gender and sex and also in our society, um, in most societies, how there is this compulsory heterosexuality. Um, but it's basically saying that there was a sex difference in gender identity, um, meaning most male bodied people um, identified as men and most female uh, bodied people identified as women. Um, and then similar with sexual orientation, most male bodied people indicated that they were attracted to women and most female bodied people indicated that they were attracted to men. So, you know, make of that, that, that one, you know, the, the, these two extra large differences, you know, what you will. So this is just a table for those of you that maybe like to read charts and, and get a sense of what um, this looks like in, in, in coefficients. Um, this isn't the Zell study. This is a study that preceded it by a couple of years. Um, very similar in scope, slightly smaller in size, very similar in findings. Um, and it was by a researcher named uh, Hyde. Um, but I just kind of wanted to give you a sense of when we're talking small, medium, large differences, what does that look like uh, in terms of efficient coefficient size? And this is from the Zill study, and it's just kind of showing um, some of the 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 uh, other research studies that they were referencing and they were pulling from. And it kind of lets you see for the things that they found a difference in, you know, what the result was. Was it, you know, men, males were more likely to do this, females were more likely to score high on this. So there are these observable differences, right? And so this starts with, you know, this gets into the meat of the chapter where they start picking apart this concept of real. Um, and they give you like four definitions of, you know, what does it mean when we say something is real? So definition number one, sex differences are real if we can measure them. So are these observable differences? Can we observe these differences? Um, and so it's worth noting that especially if you focus on the characteristics that Zill indicated have medium to large differences, we would call those clear observed differences, meaning that for most males and for most females, you're going to see an observed difference in their responses. But are they real? So now they start kind of picking apart, you know, are they really real? So one observed difference that was a medium size was smiling and helping behavior. Um, and it was women were more likely um, to smile and be helpful. However, what they learned was, is that, you know, when you aren't talking about self reports, or when people don't think that someone is watching, that a lot of this sex difference goes away, which suggests, of course, that a lot of women are out there smiling. Um, because they, as women, they are expected to smile. And if you've ever had a stranger, usually male, you know, say something like, smile, beautiful, or, you know, uh, you look better with a smile, then you might know why women go around smiling when they feel like they're being observed, um, even if they don't feel like smiling. Um, likewise, they said if there was an incentive uh, to being really honest, basically, um, that some of these differences would go away. Specifically, this one was in reference to um, that sexual behavior, right? Um, you know, we talk about women um, being stigmatized for being sexual, but men have a lot of pressure on them in society to indicate that they are sexual, even when maybe they're not. And so what they found was, is like when it came to something like reports about thinking about sex and masturbation, when they made people think that they were going to be um, uh, when they were going to be, uh, like, you know, hooked up to a lie detector test, 
um, then uh, uh, those differences between the sexes, uh, the size of that difference shrunk. Um, similarly, they could get the size of the difference to shrink if, you know, they emphasize to people that their answers were anonymous, not just confidential, but anonymous, um, that the difference then uh, shrunk. Then your book talks about like how um, priming um, and or stereotype threat works. So you can prime someone for exhibiting a behavior or or saying that they uh, up up you know, hold a stereotype by reminding them that that stereotype exists. Um, so, you know, something like empathy they talked about, um, if women were asked to identify themselves um, as being women right before a test of empathy, then oftentimes they would be more empathetic. And that's because in their brains, they've been primed to uh, think about themselves as being women. And in most societies, women are expected to be empathetic. So it's kind of like someone's reminding you of a characteristic that is uh, expected of you in society and then it makes you more likely to say oh yes I am I am that and you know empathy is kind of a, a good characteristic but you know what about if it's something negative um, and so in that sense you know stereotype is a, a specific form of priming a negative form of priming um, and this is where if people are reminded about the stereotypes that exist around uh, their group level characteristic um, that sometimes that they'll underperform um, and, and stereotype threat has been tested quite a bit when it comes to testing. Um, both racial minorities uh, and uh, females have been found to be susceptible to stereotype threat, right? So, you know, if you remind people like, oh yeah, women aren't good at math, right? That, that stereotype, um, then their math scores, and then you give them a test, then their math scores go down um, versus a control who isn't primed to think about, you know, the stereotypes related to women and math ability, uh, you know, their test scores don't um, exhibit that same level of dip. And so, you know, based on the fact that these observed differences um, can be uh, manipulated, you know, your book wants you to think about these differences in terms of, yes, they're observable, but they're not real in the naturally occurring sense, that a lot of them are perhaps learned differences. We learn as women that we're supposed to smile more. We learn from larger society as men that we are um, not just allowed, but expected to be sexual, to be thinking about sex all the time. And so then when people ask us about these things, um, and particularly as adults, you know, we've learned what is expected of us. So, you know, it might feel like, oh yes, well I smile all the time because I'm 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 just you know a smiler, um, but you know it, that isn't necessarily a, a biological difference, right? It's a learned difference, and so that's the quote that comes from your book on page forty-five. The differences Zell and his colleagues observe then are real in that we really observe them, but they don't necessarily stand up when we poke and prod them, and so that goes back to that whole difficulty of measuring difference, right? Um, the fact that you know if differences can be manipulated, easily manipulated. Um, does that mean that they're real?